gonna start recording. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, most of you probably know me as Jacob, but for those here that don't, hi, I am Jacob. I am a freshman here. My major is in animation. Uh, that is blocking the way, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, I am very passionate about animation, as you can tell from this. In fact, ever since uh, the start of 2020, I have dedicated a YouTube channel to watching and reviewing every animated movie that came out in you know, these past years and ranking them worst to best yearly. And since I was already working on this, I thought, you know what, why not turn this into a sort of fun lecture? Now, uh, in terms of animated movies of well, big news for animation in 2023, there honestly wasn't a whole lot. I mean, like, I guess there was Spider-Verse and Boy and the Heron, obviously. Uh, the Mario movie existed. Uh, Wish was big news for the wrong reasons. Um, but yeah, not, not too crazy of a year like in the past. But if you were to extend the the boundaries of animation to independent films and international films. There was actually quite a lot that came out this year uh, in no particular order listing these in. Move on the Third versus Cat's Eye, Blue Thermal, The Magician's Elephant, Susan May, Mario Bros. Movie, Rally Road Racers, To Me, The One Who Loved You, To Every You I've Loved Before, Unicorn Wars, The Amazing Maurice, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, Elemental, Nimona, Ruby Gillen, Teenage Kraken, Teenage Mutant Mayhem, The Monkey King, Little Nicholas, Happy As Can Be, The Crossing, Demo Memorial Keys, Princess Principal, Crown Handler 3, Mopka, The Forest Song, Ladybug and Cat Noir, The Movie, New Gods, Young Jen, uh, Leo, Trolls Band Together, Wish, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Cabin Fever, Under the Boardwalk, The Boy and the Heron, Merry Little Batman, Ruby and Justice League Parts 1 and 2, Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget, Tunnel to Summer, Exit of Goodbyes, Lonely Castle in the Mirror, Migration, The Inventor, Deep Sea, Donia, Blind Willow, Sleeping Woman, Mabaroshi, Paw Patrol 2, and Ernest and Celestine 2. And those aren't even all the ones that I have watched. There were three movies that I intentionally left off of this this list for the lecture, but I will still include in my YouTube video. And those are It's Gotta Be Perfect, Western Spaghetti, and Sound Euphonium Ensemble Contest. The reason why these two, they're really YouTube videos, not, not really movies. They're Nintendo parodies, Nintendo horror Western parodies. Why did I watch them? Because the first one that came out in 2020, I liked a lot, included in my list. Watch them every year. They get worse and worse. I'm not including these two. Um, this one is a special for my fav one of my favorite shows of all time. It is an anime about band kids, but I'm not really including this because it's really a one hour special, not really a movie. But if I was counting this, it would be in my number two. Uh, I am also aware there were some movies that I did not get a chance to see, those being The First Slam Dunk, Blue Giant, and Expector Sun. Slam Dunk and Blue Giant, um, they were available in very limited theaters. I did not get a chance to see them. And Inspector Sun, the website I was watching it on kept buffering and I gave up and it was the day before I was presenting them to the Honors College as a test audience. So I got lazy. But anyway, with that all out of the way, let's get to the worst animated film. You probably already saw this on the list, but the worst animated film of 2023 by a landslide is Rally Road Racers. This movie is awful. It is boring. It is annoying. It's about this uh, well, actually, before I get into the story, it's from Vanguard Animation, the same people who made Spark, Fearless, No Malone, one of my favorite bad movies of all time. Uh, but this is on a whole nother la level of bad. It's boring, it's annoying, it's ugly. It's about a weird lemur cat looking character and his town is getting demolished by a frog racer. And he says, hey, if I win this race, you stop demolishing my town. And the frog goes, bet. And the main character um, teams up with 
a goat voiced by J.K. Simmons doing a very bad Russian accent to teach him how to race and be a mechanic. And there is a love interest that betrays the main character for reasons. Money? Who knows? I don't know. And the main character is voiced by Jimmy O. Yang, who cannot voice act. He also appears later on in this list. Uh, he sounds bored throughout most of it. But um, yeah, I, but the worst thing about this movie is somehow it got widely released in theaters just enough to make it to my town, Macomb, Illinois, which is infamous for not including international or independent movies. So this got a wide release when Boy and the Heron, Susan May, Lonely Castle in the Mirror got very limited theatrical runs when they deserved whatever this got, this did not. I honestly, I don't even want to talk about this. We're, we're moving on. <laughs> uh, next up, Mavka. Okay, now this is, a, this is a bit of a doozy. So this is a Ukrainian animated film that, that is an adaptation of the 1918 play called The Forest Song. It was in production for almost eight years, and it was nearing its end towards early 2023 when everything happened, when uh, Russia was bombing, you know, Kiev, which also happened to be where the animation studio was residing in. So they had to finish this movie. They had to work on this throughout all of the terrible stuff that was happening to them, despite their lives being threatened. And because of that, I'm honestly very glad that this movie exists. I'm glad that they were able to get this out because it serves as like a beacon of hope for the, for the people working on it and for its audience. And like, I'm just glad it was able to get out. Makes me feel all the more guilty to say that I didn't really like it. I kind of hated it. It kind of, sucks ass. Um, the animation, it gets very pretty at points. The backgrounds are pretty. The characters look like skeletons though, and some of the forest creature designs look very ugly. Sorry about that. Um, the story is a very standard nature versus human interference um, tale, where everyone is like, humans bad, forest creatures bad, and then the main character, Mavka, is like, what if we reunite these two and it's just kind of I don't know it's just kind of boring and the forest creatures are very annoying especially this one who is super ugly and whose voice actor is doing the worst Alan Tudyk impression of all time where where like he talks like this and whoa whoa kids don't you don't you love to hear this kind of voice it's it's very bad it's honestly kind of annoying but even with that i'm i'm glad this movie exists and i'm very glad that this wasn't the worst movie of the year because rally road racers exists uh moving on we have leo the adam sandler lizard netflix musical movie yeah adam, adam sandler's in this movie and there are 50, I kid you not, 50 songs. Some of the songs are two sentences long, and that's it. The story is about this talking lizard, pet lizard in a, in a, in a fifth grade class, going around and solving the kids' problems. Some of the kids' problems range from uh, having a drone that is quite literally a helicopter parent, having a, a speech impediment, being rich i guess i don't know it's it's it is a fever dream but i can't say it is better than the last time there was an adam sandler animated musical <laughs> there are a lot of there are a lot of funny posters of this <laughs> hey it, my choice was between that and undertale <laughs> Um, what's next? Oh, these two. Um, nobody likes these Diary of a Wimpy Kid animated movies. Uh, they are wasted potential. And Cabin Fever, when it says Cabin Fever, that is a lie. 
It is not an adaptation of the Cabin Fever book. It is a completely original Christmas heist movie with Cabin Fever slapped onto the title for marketing purposes. So, uh, ugh, no thank you. And then Paw Patrol 2, um, I don't know, it's on par with the first movie. The pups are superheroes and Sky punches meteors in an honestly very beautiful looking climax, but I don't know. It's a very whatever movie. Uh, moving, we're now moving from the awful movies to just movies that are regular bad. Starting with The Amazing Maurice. Uh, this is a Terry Pratchett Discworld book adaptation that I've heard keeps the original story of, of a cat and mice pulling heists, I guess. But for the most part in this movie, it just comes off as a Puss in Boots ripoff. Uh, I don't really remember a whole lot from it, but the only thing I do remember a whole lot from is this one character whose whole gimmick is um, in, a, in, in a story like this, um, this cliche or trope would happen. So that means we need to let that happen. And that joke gets repeated so much. And the climax of the joke is at the end when the guy character goes well in a story like this the boy and the girl would get together so that means we should get together uh that's not gonna spawn some toxic mindsets in the future uh moving on we have merry little batman i know that some people like this i don't i got 20 minutes in it was kind of bored it's a very regular batman christmas special Batman is a wholesome dad. Damien is annoying, I guess. Archib Archib not Archibald. Is it Archibald? Alfred. <laughs> <laughs> Alfred is ugly looking. And then that's it. I don't know. Oh. Okay, this movie. So, history lesson, when DreamWorks was bought out by Universal, uh, their partner studio, Oriental DreamWorks, um, broke off from them and became Pearl Studio, and their debut film was Over the Moon back in 2020 on Netflix, a movie that I really liked, and I was really looking forward to The Monkey King, their next film, except that these are kind of different because Over the Moon had people from Disney, Glenn Keane, on it and this just had you know regular bad animation studios part partnering with Netflix and Pearl Studio so I wasn't really too excited uh, the story is an adaptation of the journey to the West except not really it's an adaptation of the first half and it cuts off right when the monkey king gets reawakened so that is something. Oh, I thought I pressed next for a second. Whew. Um, it's an interesting take on the Monkey King character. The whole take on him is that he is told all his life, all his upbringing, that he's worthless, he's a pebble, he means nothing, he doesn't belong with anyone. But then he takes that and says, hey, maybe I don't belong with people down here, but I belong with the gods in the heavens. And so he goes around slaying demons and building up his ego, his arrogance, his selfishness. And it's an interesting idea, except that they overplay his arrogance and selfishness way too much that it becomes annoying and you can't really sympathize with him. That coupled with, yet again, Jimmy O. Yang, who gives probably the worst voice performance of the entire year, in my opinion, if you don't count the Alan Tudyk wannabe from Mavka. He's, he doesn't only sound bored, but also kind of obnoxious, like, yeah, I'm the monkey king, wow. There's also this really bad metal song in it. There's also this girl character uh, she does not matter. The only thing she does is possess Buddha. That is a thing. That is a thing in the movie. She possesses Buddha. Um, but yeah, just bad, honestly. Uh, Demo Memorial Keys, the worst anime film of 2023. So this is an adaptation of a rhythm game called 
you know, demo. And from the cutscenes, it looks like a very beautiful and poignant story about loss and family and moving on. Except that this movie doesn't really adapt that very well. It, it does the, the American Animation Studio thing where we can't have a movie this dark and this depressing, so let's throw in a bunch of silly, annoying side characters to, to have the kids laugh. And then it throws in a subplot of the girl, I guess, in the future, going through the same character arc because amnesia, I guess? I don't know. It is pretty, but that's stretching it a bit for a 3D anime that doesn't properly render its graphics. The music was really good, but that's because it was from a rhythm game, so yeah, there's that. I think after this, we're out of the bad movies. Yeah, we're out of the bad movies. We're into the okay movies. Uh, this is a Justice League and Ruby fun crossover duology, except that is a lie because despite this being advertised as a DC project, you need to be a Ruby super fan to enjoy this because it throws a deluge of Ruby lore, characters, developments from the nine nearing 10 season show that I have never watched. Ergo, I was very confused and oh, kind of bored by it. But it is fun. The action is really cool. The villain, um, his plan doesn't make any sense, but it's, it's fun, I guess. And the Justice League is very compelling, and the Ruby characters aren't so far behind. Easily, the standouts are Weiss and Batman and Green Lantern and The Flash, I guess. But for the most part, you just watch it for the action and then never watch it again. Yeah. Uh, next is Donia and the Princess of Aleppo. Um, uh, the copy I was given of this movie did not come with subtitles, but I was I was able to get the gist of the plot. Um, this is a French animated movie about a girl named Donia whose family flees Syria because of you know the war, and to conquer all of the trials and tribulations along the way, she uses magical plant seeds because I think she's descendant from an ancient civilization of people with star hairs. I don't know, but it is very pretty. Donya herself is very charming. And I would say that this treats the subject matter with the sincerity it deserves, except that there are these two-headed totem side characters that serve as comedic reliefs that kind of break the tension and just speak the subtext, I guess. I don't know. I. It didn't come with subtitles. So maybe I'll have to get a copy that has subtitles in order to properly rank this in the future. Uh, Trolls Band Together. This series is my guilty pleasure, mainly because of Anna Kendrick. I, I, I love her and everything she's in. Um, the story follows Branch discovering he has long lost brothers that he needs to uh, band together. Wow, let's see, there's the title. And also, Poppy has a sister, I guess. I don't know, there's not a whole lot to say, except that the villains, Velvet and Veneer, are easily the best parts of the movie with fantastic rubber hose animation. And Velvet is voiced by Amy Schumer and, and her whole gimmick is that she's stealing people's talents to present herself as as glorious that that's just very funny that's that's very funny yeah uh what is next after this oh okay mario movie and migration i'm sure that there are some people who would get mad at me for placing mario movie this low the thing about me is if you know me illumination and i I have never liked a single Illumination movie. Despicable Me, The Lorax, Secret Life of Pets. I never liked them. I, I think their scripts are very lazy, both in emotional sentiment and in jokes, and they've gotten worse over the years. But I will say 
these two movies are easily their best, which doesn't say a lot because they're both just kind of okay. I understand that people have a lot of fun with Mario's um, Easter eggs and, and just seeing your childhood favorites on screen. And I had some of that too, but sometimes the scenes, the story, just stuff just happens one after the other without really, it follows an end then structure rather than this happens because this happens, therefore this happens, but it, it just feels like this happens and then this happens and then this happens. Uh, yeah, so I was very disappointed by it and I got a lot more mileage out of Chari 5's rewrite of the movie, which somehow fit the Luigi's Mansion lore into it. And his rewrite is so much better than Illuminations. Now, Migration is Illumination's first completely original movie in a long while, good lord, done, uh, directed by the director of Ernest and Celestine. So, oddly enough, I was kind of excited. And I think since it was done by a different director, it was, it, I guess it, ah, let me rephrase that. I guess since it was done by a different director, that's why I like it so much because it follows a different structure than most American animated films. And for the first time ever, I was actually kind of close to crying in an Illumination movie, which doesn't really say much, but I don't know. I was, I was just, having a fun time. I like the cast. I like how wholesome it is. But these two movies are just kind of okay. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> All right, Ladybug and Cat Noir the movie. I have never seen the show, but I I know enough. I know enough just from how the fan base is. Um yeah, a story about a girl named Marinette who becomes Ladybug superhero, and then Adrienne becomes Cat Noir superhero to take down Adrienne's dad. And the two do not know their secret identity from their true identity, which gives way to the most famous thing about the franchise, <laughs> the love square. Now the movie, the movie completely gets rid of these two. So we're left with these but it doesn't change the fact with how funny and kind of annoying it is to see this unfold. It's kind of self-explanatory. Um, the, the action's pretty good. It's a musical. Some of the musical numbers are pretty good, except for one thing that has bothered me ever since I watched it. Uh, in the English dub, Christina V voices Marinette, yet, they keep the same singer from the French version and their voices are nothing alike. And what baffles me is that Christina V sings her parts in the original series. Yeah, uh, moving on. That, that's just kind of whatever. All right, these two. Um, New Gods, Yang Jian, and Deep Sea. Uh, let's start with New Gods. So this is, I think, Beijing in Lights? I, I think that's the animation studio. This is their second film in their New Gods series following New Gods Ninja Reborn in 2021. This adapting, I think, one of the, the Chinese legends. Uh, the story follows this mercenary who's capturing beasts. And uh, I got to remember this. Uh, he has to track down this kid who's the key to world destruction. But then he realizes he's not. And then there's this whole plot point about trapping foxes, fire foxes beneath a mountain. And if they're unleashed, it saves the world but kills the immortals above. I don't know. I was just I was just having fun because of the animation and the action. And in the first half, the main character is very sarcastic and doesn't give any cares and just has a deadpan face the whole way through. That's probably why I liked the first half better than the second. Inversely, I liked Deep Sea's second half better than the first because the first is kind of a mess, but the second half has the main character actually go through a character arc. 
Deep Sea is kind of like if you took Spirited Away and the ocean and then put them together. It is basically Spirited Away on a cruise. Uh, it's pretty fun. The animation gets very cartoony at some points, which is um, not, not awful. It's pretty typical of Chinese animation from what I've seen, but I don't know. It just took me out of it sometimes. For the most part, these two are just kind of okay. What is next? Oh, The Magician's Elephant. I forgot this came out this year. Uh, this is an adaptation of a children's book written by one of the Toy Story 4 writers about a boy who lost his sister in a war and he wants to find his sister. And to do that, he has to follow the magician's elephant, but the elephant is kept caged by the cane and he has to complete three trials to free the elephant. I don't know. It's it's a very pretty and it's a very pretty and charming movie. And anytime the brother and the sister are on are on screen, it's honestly pretty great. Uh what is next? Ooh, all right. Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken. So, this movie, I have a huge soft spot for this movie mainly because like despite it being kind of like okay, it's pretty different from a lot of DreamWorks's other films. They're like actually taking risks. They're exploring different stories and I really appreciate it for that. Uh, the animation is very pretty. I love the rubber hose animation of the Kraken designs. I love how they have to specify that they have to pretend to have spines to fit in with the humans. Um, yeah, I, I really liked it. But the one element that I'm not sure it's a plus or a minus is that this feels very Disney Channel original movie. Like, you have this shy, quirky, uh, ubu girl, geeky, and is, who wants to impress her crush, and but then it turns out she's a princess of a long lost uh, civilization. But then this icy cheerleader queen stereotype comes in is like, hey, I'm gonna kill you. And then there's a big kaiju battle at the end that is actually really good. And then it caps the film off with her being crowned prom queen for no reason and getting together with the geek guy she has a crush on. And it's just, it's just very, it's, it's very charming or annoying or charming depending on your view of Disney Channel original movies. Uh, it's, it's a very classic feeling movie. I'll give it that. All right. Wish. Okay. All right. Um, it's not as bad as people say. It's, it's, it's not really that bad. Yes. The animation, while very pretty, and I am a defender of it at some points, um, the deleted scene looks way better. There is a deleted scene of the movie that just came out six days ago that should have been kept in. Um, the goat is the most annoying thing ever. Um, Chris Pine villain could have been written better, but for the most part, it's, it's a very classic feeling Disney movie that you just can't help but be like, eh, this is pretty good, I guess. I don't know, it's just pretty okay. Um, I will say, what does deserve all the hate is the soundtrack easily the worst one out of all of the Disney musicals. Um, uh, Welcome to Rosas, bland and forgettable. I'm a star, utterly annoying, uh, knowing what I know now, um, doesn't really progress musically. This wish is, I, I like the chorus of this wish, but it's kind of standard. Uh, this is the thanks I get is the only one I would consider actually kind of good, but it still leaves something to be desired. Also, Chris Pine. Everything Chris Pine. Chris, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for the most part, this is just, I don't know. I was kind of disappointed by it. I was expecting it to be great, but nah. All right, now we're heading into movies that I would consider like genuinely good. And these two, 
I are probably the most cursed movies out of this entire bunch. We have Unicorn Wars and Blind Willow Sleeping Woman. One of the movies is about a group of bears going to war against unicorns, impaling them, gouging their eyes out, and peeing on each other. Blind Willow Sleeping Woman is about um, a guy who is nihilistic, another a uh, schizophrenic guy who who hallucinates a frog telling him to save Tokyo from another earthquake after the 311 disaster and the guy who is nihilistic uh, is hooking up with strangers just to feel anything in his empty sorrowful soul uh, yeah these two movies are very very explicit these are the most trigger warning movies out of the entire list Unicorn Wars especially is very like violent and gets right into the nitty gritty of like war. It is an anti-war film, but honestly it doesn't really say much about what can be done against it. It feels like horrifying for the sake of it. And Blind Willow Sleeping Woman is, I forgot to say, it's an anthology movie, but none of the stories really connect with each other or have a theme and some of the some of the stories aren't really resolved in satisfying ways, but I had a good time with these two. I forget what's next. Oh, The Inventor. Uh, this is a stop motion animated film about the last few years of Leonardo da Vinci's life when he was serving for the French king after he moved away from Italy because the Pope did not like him researching human bodies. So yeah, for the most part, it's pretty cool. Um, the imagination sequences are easily the best part. Um, you know what is the worst part? Um, not the fact that it's a musical, but the fact that the actor for Leonardo, he doesn't sing his songs, he talks his songs, which I don't really understand. Daisy Ridley's in it and she sings. Um, uh, da Vinci's henchman, no, not henchman, uh, his apprentice, he sings, the French king sings, Da Vinci himself, he just speaks the lyrics, not even rhythmically like rap, he just, he just talks, which, which is baffling, like, why wouldn't you get an actor who can act and sing, but that's just me, uh, these two movies, all right, so fun fact, these two movies were released around the same time, and it was advertised, that the ending changes based on the order you viewed them in. So apparently um, the blue poster, I'm just gonna call these like blue and pink just to shorthand it. Um, blue to pink is apparently the bad ending and the pink to blue is the good ending. Or rather I would call it the blue to pink is the non-existent ending and pink to blue is the only ending that makes sense because if you view it from like, all right, maybe I should describe these movies based on what they are individually. Um, the blue movie is often described as the love one where it's just two characters and their relationship all throughout their lives from middle school to high school to college to when they have a married life to when they're an old couple and it's very sweet. The second one is described as the sci-fi one where the same main character but a different girl in an alternate universe um, fall in love in a science lab but then they fear that their parents will get remarried so they try to go to a different universe to I, I don't know escape but then the girl dies and he tries to bring her back and I don't know when you when you view it from from blue to pink it just feels like you're watching homework the second time Whereas from pink to blue, it feels much more cohesive and like there's a beginning and an end. But like, yeah, I if I were ranking these individually, this would be much lower on the list. It would honestly be behind um, Trolls 3. But for the most part, this makes a pretty good story, a pretty good duology of movies. Um, blue Thermal. I watched this very early in the year. Uh... It's a, I would say it's a pretty good movie. The characters are very likable. The, the bonds between them are very endearing, but the story is kind of all over the place. So 
it starts off as a girl, a freshman in college, um, accidentally breaking one of the aviation club's planes, and so she joins their club to repay them. Then it's about her um, trying to get along with this one guy who they actually have a genuinely endearing friendship later on. But then the plot goes to her having a rival in this rival club, and then the plot's about her dealing with her sister who left her and who is the captain of that rival club. Then the captain of her club dies, except except he doesn't actually, but the characters don't know that, and they spend two minutes grieving over him before going, ah, we're fine, we're completely fine, we're going to win this contest. And then it's just like, I don't know. It's it's very all over the place. Uh, I was going to say something. Oh, yeah. But the flying sequences are very pretty. They're a lot of fun. And as I said, the characters are very endearing, especially the main girl. But for the most part, it just feels kind of unfocused, but I had fun watching it. Now, we are getting into movies that are genuinely great that I would honestly rewatch, starting with... Chicken Run 2. Yeah. Um, hot take. The original Chicken Run is not one of my favorite DreamWorks films. I'd honestly give it a 6 out of 10. This one, I think, is a vast improvement because, like, it is just much more fun. It's a straight-up heist movie. Um, Ginger's character is very interesting, going from someone who was in captivity wanting to break out, now in fear of others. Um, capturing her child, she keeps her child in captivity. Well, I say captive, it's not that it's not that severe. It's just a very interesting um, development of Ginger's character. The animation's awesome. Um, Ardman's humor, Ardman's British humor, uh, definitely shines and is so refreshing, especially in this age of American pop culture references in American films. Uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun with it, and I wouldn't mind giving it another rewatch. All right. Um, the most underrated animated film of 2023 is Under the Boardwalk. How many of you have heard of this movie? Yeah. Oh, have you? Oh, wow. That's surprising. Um, so a little bit of background after of this movie. This was originally going to come out in 2022, but then the Paramount CEO was like, eh, we're not even gonna bother with animated movies. And so this year, two weeks before the movie was supposed to be shown in theaters, the very first trailer was dropped, and then nothing else. And then the movie came out in 50 total theaters in the entire United States. And then one week after the movie came out in theaters. It was dumped onto streaming and then forgotten about. So this movie really just came and went, which is a shame because this movie is genuinely great. It is a hermit crab Romeo and Juliet musical between, between New Jersey hermit crabs and sea crabs with Michael Sarah and Kiki Palmer. And it is, the animation is super pretty. The music, leagues above Leo and Wish, and it every single song is a bop, and there is a deaf character voiced by someone who is deaf, I say voiced, and who has some of the best and most wholesome scenes in the movie and maybe in the entire year. And if I had a nickel for every time a, a male character acted by Michael Sarah got together with a female character whose name was Ramona, Two, you, you know the rest of it. But yeah, it is such a fun movie. I really recommend all of you like watch it. Uh, what was next after this? Oh yeah, The Crossing. So the director of this movie said that she based the story off of her grandmother's experience in fleeing, I forget which country, but it was a country during, I think, World War I. I could be wrong, but... It's, it's based on that. It's based on the escapades she gets into 
as she's running away from the conflict. And But that doesn't really come across in the movie, which is actually to its benefit. Because the country itself, the conflict, because everything doesn't really have a name, it's unspecified, it can serve as a stand-in for anyone who has ever who has or is going through stuff like this. Um, the animation is done with paintings on glass. Um, the story follows a, a girl and her brother um, getting in trouble with an aristocrat family that's trying to stuff them, um, getting lost in the woods during the winter, um, joining the circus, being in a concentration camp, um, experiencing the most pointless love triangle in any movie ever. I don't know why that was in there. But uh, for the most part, it's a genuinely harrowing and honestly great movie about this kind of subject. It's, it's honestly worth the price of admission for the animation alone. It's uh, free on Prime Video with a subscription. So yeah, if you have that, um, I do really recommend this one. I think the next one, oh, okay, I forgot. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. Um, I was one of the people who was super salty after what they did with Rise. Um, Rise was amazing. It did not deserve to get canceled. But this um, Seth Rogen interpretation of the Turtles is not too bad. Um, I, lo I love the animation, the sort of gritty, graffiti, um, arcane style of it all. The action is amazing. The music, too. Um, the Turtles are all very likable in their, like, t actually teenage form where Leo's like the responsible one, uh, Donnie's like computer and anime guy and whatever. Also, they are all voiced by actual teenagers and Nicholas Cantu. Uh, yeah, um, I like Splinter in this movie. I like the villain. Uh, it's just a very likable and very charming epic movie. Uh, I think I was going to say something else, but I, I forgot. We're moving on. Okay. All right. Maboroshi, or Alice and Teresa's Illusion Factory, if you're not an idiot. Uh, sorry. But, okay, just a little tangent. The English title for this movie is Maboroshi, which is kind of weird. Translating a, a one-word generic title into Japanese doesn't make it any less generic. Just call it The Illusion Factory. Uh, but that's just a minor nitpick. Anyway, the the direct this is the second movie from from uh, up and coming director Mario Kara, who's who's been a famous writer in anime, but her directorial debut was Makia, When the Promised Flower Blooms, one of my favorite animated movies of all time. So I was super excited for this. Uh, was kind of disappointed by it. Um, First of all, the animation is super pretty. It's, it gives this very like gothic and dark and gloomy atmosphere. Uh, and the music is hauntingly beautiful. The main melody is infectiously like dark and memorable. The story is kind of okay. Uh, it's about these people not realizing they're a ghost town after a factory explosion. So it's been like 11 years and they none of them have aged, I guess. Um, but then there's this girl who one, who one day came in from the outside world and grows up and she's treated like the key to breaking the ghost town or I don't know, fixing it. I have no idea. Um, there's the titular romance which is sweet in some moments, but it's not really developed that well. There's an unrequited incestuous love. Okay. Um, at least it's unrequited. So that's good. Um, so yeah. Uh, kind of disappointed, but honestly, the art and the music alone carries this movie to the point where I would consider it great. It's it's on Netflix. Yeah, it's it's pretty great. Uh, I think the next one is, oh, Little Nicholas, Happy As Can Be. So this is a French animated movie about the famous Little Nicholas comics in France um, involving the two people, I, for, I keep forgetting their names, but the two people, the authors behind Little Nicholas, 
and their story intertwined with a bunch of silly little vignettes about little Nicholas uh, getting wrapped up in some of his adventures with his friends. Um, there's not really much of a connection between the two aside from a few scenes where where the Nicholas character emerges from the pages and has conversations with the authors, which I think are the best parts of the movie, kind of like the author having a conversation with his creation. I, I really like that. Um, the animation is super pretty. Uh, it was very deserving of its Annie Award nomination. And yeah, not much else to say. It's very cute, it's very charming, very emotional at some points, especially when one of the authors um, passes away and Nicholas and the other author have to deal with that. Um, the film, the story feels cut off at the end, but it's just very charming, very cute. Uh, the subtitle I would give this movie is Me and the Boys, the movie, because it very much feels like that. Nicholas just getting into so much trouble with his friends. Uh, Okay, now we are heading into movies that I think are straight up amazing. Uh, first of all, Loop on the Third versus Cat's Eye. This is a crossover between Loop on the Third and Cat's Eye. And even though I have not seen either of these before, aside from the Loop on the First movie back in 2021, yeah, 2020, no, yeah, 2020. Um, I had genuinely so much fun watching this. I thought the action was great, the animation was pretty, the music was awesome, and I think the characters have very fun um, repertoire with each other. But my favorite part about it is the um, chief of police from Lupin the Third and the investigator from Cat's Eye have this subplot together where they're following the heroes that they're trying to capture while also trying to uncover this um, mystery involving this secret bad evil organization. And the funniest thing about it is they have no idea that the main characters are there and the main characters have no idea that they are there with them. So it's just really funny seeing like these two groups of people against each other going Place, going to the same places, having the same objectives without realizing that the other is there. It's just very funny. But yeah, it's on a Prime Video with a subscription and like I'm not familiar with either of these series and I had a fun time with it and I think y'all will have a fun time with it too. Uh, Ernest and Celestine, Trip to Gibberishia. Uh This is a, a sequel... 10 years after the first Ernest and Celestine movie, one of the most adorable films to get ignored in 2013 because of Frozen. Um, uh, this movie, uh, the original movie was about like a mouse and a bear becoming friends, but then there are different societies of mice and bear are, discrimin are discriminatory against you know each other and everything to do with that. Whereas this, um, involves them returning to the bear's home where it turns out music is banned under the legion of his father's fascist ways. Um, so yeah, this duology kind of is the cute characters solving world problems. First racism, now fascism. I wonder what the next movie is going to be about. Um, um, uh, what was I going to say? The animation's very pretty. It does handle its subject matter a little bit more clumsy than in the first one. Like it doesn't pinpoint a motivation for the bear's father, uh, but for the most fun, oh, sorry. But for the most part, it's just very cute, very charming, and yeah, very emotional too. Uh, the Tunnel to Summer, The Exit of Goodbyes, uh, this is from Studio Clap. Uh, this is their second movie after last year's Pompo the Cinephile, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. And I think this movie just shows their um, versatility, their diversity, and their filmmaking. Um, Pompo is much more of a manic comedy, whereas Tunnel is a romance drama reminiscent of, like, Your Name of what's that movie voices of a different star i don't know what that one is called but um it's about these 
two high schoolers who discovered the Urashima Tunnel, which is a tunnel where if you go in it, you could have your wish made, but the entire outside world um, speeds by in a flash. Time moves, different, moves differently, and they're both investigating that phenomenon. And the romance is very cute. I, I love their dynamic together. There's this one scene where they reenact how they first meet, and it is very adorable. Um, the only thing is, in the ending, one of them goes into the tunnel for a long amount of time and then comes back out. So they're the same age, but it's been 13 years for the other person, and they reunite, and the film cuts off after they kiss. So um, it's, it just feels like a way for the creators to go, well, there's our ending. We don't have to think about this any further. But for the most part, if you ignore that, it's, it's honestly a pretty beautiful and amazing movie. Uh, next up, Elemental. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a very underrated movie for Pixar. Uh, being their first proper romance film since WALL-E, one of my, my favorite Pixar movie, one of my favorite films of all time. Um, Ember and Wade are not as um, big of a romantic couple as WALL-E and Eve. Well, actually, not as compelling or, or cute as WALL-E and Eve, but they work very well for what they are, and I think... I think, uh, contrary to popular belief, I think the elemental world is very lovely and is a lot of fun to explore through all the squash and stretch animation, the beautiful uh, animation and imagery, and how it deals with the whole like, like immigrant family or like, like, like how kids want to go. Wants, want to diverge from their family's expectations of them, I think was handled very well in, Am in Ember's character. And yeah, it's just a very cute, very fun, wholesome, emotionally devastating film. And yeah, not much else to say. It's just very good. All right, okay. I know some people are gonna be pretty confused by this. Um, this is, all right, I feel like before I talk about this, I have to talk about Princess Principle. So this is a spy thriller anime. It is also in my top three favorite shows of all time. And after its first season, there's been a series of movies uh, released over the years to compensate for a second season, I guess. The first one came out in 21. Uh, the second one came out in 22. This one in 23. Uh, and then no signs of the fourth yet. Um, the first one deals with more character-related struggles. Um, the second one deals is more action-oriented, but this one by far has the best story with, with um, a sort of commentary on struggles in positions of power, struggles between those in like royal families, I guess, and has genuinely great moments. Not much else to say because, I don't know, there's a lot I could say reserved for hardcore fans of the series, but like, I don't know. Yeah, just trust me that it's really great. But like, if you want to watch these shows, um, this is on Prime Video. Uh, these three, uh, I don't know where they are. Uh, don't ask me how I watch them. Uh, yeah. Um, here we go. The Boy and the Heron. Um, Hayao Miyazaki's uh, uh, from the creator of Spirited Away, his uh, last movie for real before he changes his mind again. Um, it, for the most part, it does genuinely feel like a spiritual, oh, spiritual successor to Spirited Away in, in just how like dreamlike it is, more so in this film than any other. Also coincidentally, the most autobiographical, most based on Hayao Miyazaki's personal life. Um, I didn't really get most of it, and it is hard to get into the headspace of the main character, but for the most part, I was just having a lot of fun on this like ride throughout this whimsical fantasy realm, 
that is like full full of parakeets, full of uh, a Dave Bautista chicken king, uh, Robert Pattinson blue heron, and then a and then a fire witch. I don't know. It's just a lot of fun. Very 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 cool. Very amazing. Uh, yeah. But then there's Suzume, the latest movie from Makoto Shinkai, creator of Your Name and Weathering With You, two of my favorite movies of all time. I'm sure you're seeing a pattern here. Uh, Suzume, uh, Your Name, Weathering With You, and Suzume, I would like to think make up a trilogy that I would like to call the Disaster Movie Trilogy where one of them deals with meteors, one of them deals with climate change, and one of them deals with earthquakes. And all of them involve, you know, romance. And even though Weathering With You by far has the best, like, romance out of all of these, um, Suzume and the, the guy Sota, I think, I think the two have, are very cute together. And the story, I think, is the best out of these three. It involves Suzume going through Japan, locking all these doors that are gateways for earth, for earthworm monsters to emerge and cause earthquakes. And it involves her dealing with her trauma over losing her mother in the 311 Japan earthquake. And there's the second movie dealing with that. Um, but I do think this is the weakest out of the three. Well, actually, before that, I should also say um, best soundtrack in any movie in 2023, this, I I think. But um, anyway, I think this is the weakest out of the three here, mainly because, well, okay, to get these out of the way, the story sometimes feels like a little bit more episodic, the climax feels like it goes on a little bit long, and um, Sota gets turned into a chair, and Suzume falls in love with him while he's a chair. Um, sits on him, steps on him, kisses him, uh, all the things. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's just funny. Like, even the two, even though the two are very cute together, it's, it's very wholesome until you realize he's a chair. <laughs> yes. Does he turn back into a Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. <laughs> Imagine if he didn't turn back into a chair. I'm trying to memory chair. What? It's specifically like her childhood chair that like. Oh yeah, it is her childhood chair. Yeah, the one she clung on to. Her memoir of the earthquake disaster. Wow. <laughs> oh yeah. No. <laughs> No. I mean, one of them kind of turns into bubbles for two seconds, but in the, in the weather movie, but like, nah. Oh, and in this movie, she turns into Ash. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, here we go across the Spider Verse. Uh, yeah. Um, I feel like there's not a lot to say that hasn't already been said. Celebration of animation, of all different styles. Hobie, um, um, my guy. Uh, Gwen gets a lot more character development here than in the first movie. Miles uh, and Miguel's story. Miguel kind of representing the toxic side of Spider-Man fans being Spider-Man specifically has to go through these story beats. And Miles being like, no. I don't want to lose my dad. I don't want to go through trauma just so I can be Spider-Man. And it's just like, the action is very good. Albeit very, the action scenes are very long. It feels more like a masterpiece of an episode than a masterpiece of a movie per se. Still an amazing movie. Um, just that there is one movie that I think is even better than this and there are two movies I like better. This next one, I don't think is critically should be put above Spider-Verse, but I love it so much to the point where if I could put it at number one without consequence, I would. But 
I, I just love it so much. So in this next one, Lonely Castle in the Mirror. All right, this is an adaptation of a book of the same name, and it is about a girl named Kokoro who um, stays at home all day, doesn't go to school because she's bullied, because she's ridiculed, because she can't connect with people. One day, she discovers her mirror can serve as a portal to a castle location where six other student, where six other kids skipping school reside in. They are teased by a wolf queen that if they find a key within the castle, they can unlock the wishing room and their wish will be granted and the castle will disappear and they will never see each other again without their memories. Um, for the most part, though, it's not really about them looking for the key. Really, it's just them vibing in the castle, talking about, you know, their struggles, their their personal lives. Like, this compared to Spider-Verse, I'm much more of a sucker for, like, quiet, introspective character dramas rather than big, exciting, like, conflict movies. And this has, like, a lot of devastating, like, I don't know why that's there, but this has a lot of very emotionally devastating moments and very real to a lot of experiences. Um, like, completely forgetting Unicorn Wars and Blind Willow Sleeping Woman, this probably should also come with a trigger warning because there are two moments in the film where one of the characters is experiencing like very not not severe it's but it comes very close to like kids around them and even like in one scene a very very horrifyingly drawn o uh, older guy um coming very close to, to harassing and ruining the lives of these kids and it's very like troubling but also like the scenes where they're all just talking about their struggles and powering through them kokoro especially goes from this very shy quiet very broken character to honestly a true hero reaching out to others and letting them know that she's there for them it's it's just a very it's a very good movie uh i will say the new the very new currently coming out manga adaptation is doing a much better job pacing the story sometimes it feels very slow especially with this one scene that with them talking about parallel universes on first watch it seems interesting but on second watch you know they're just wasting their time but for the most part i just love this movie so much it probably doesn't deserve to be up this high but ah, who cares uh, you all came for the actual best animated film of the year, Nimona. Yeah. All right. So history lesson about this movie. Yeah. Um, this uh, Nimona is a web graphic novel written by N.D. Stevenson, creator of the She-Ra reboot. And this was going, this was picked up um, earlier on in like 2018, 2019. I guess somewhere around that time by Blue Sky Studios, the same people behind Ice Age, Robots, the Peanuts movie, Rio, and this movie was going to be released under their name. Then Disney and Fox merged, which, which meant Disney bought out Blue Sky. And the release date for this movie, because, you know, LGBT and Disney, uh, kept being pushed back, pushed back until 2021, February of 2021, What's this? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, February of... <laughs> ignore that. February of 2021, Blue Sky was shut down by Disney. So many people lost their jobs. They were laid off. And this movie, 75% of the way through its completion, was canceled. Until Netflix... There we go. Netflix, um, in the middle of 2022, picked up um, production of the movie. And... It was released under their name, 
in 2023, and it is easily the best animated film of 2023. The animation is super pretty. It is reminiscent of classic uh, children's storybooks. There are some shots in the movie that I would argue are rival across the Spider-Verse's animation. And um, the story is a lot of fun and emotionally devastating being about a commoner knight getting framed for killing a queen and teaming up with a nefarious shapeshifter uh, named Nimona to take down the government. It is a lot of fun. And Nimona as a character is also a lot of fun. Very gleefully murderous, impeccably voiced by Chloe Grace Moretz, um, which is especially cathartic for me because I remember being so sad at this movie's cancellation, not just because I read the book and it's very good, but because I knew that with this movie being canceled, that would mean Chloe Grace Moretz's last role, last previous role would be in the terrible Tom and Jerry movie where she acted very terribly. So uh, I'm very glad that she had this. I am very glad that she is up for running in Best Voice Acting at the Annie Awards. Uh, Mary Little Batman, Migration, uh, Susan May, Mario Rose movie. Uh, get out of there. You're not Chloe Grace Moretz. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There are points in the, movie, in the movie where it sometimes seems a bit too silly. There's one character, Ambrosius, the, the, the Golden Knight person. Uh, sometimes he gets a little grating which is sad because he's voiced by Eugene from the Try Guys. Um, but for the most part, I, I don't really care. This movie is, is very good, very fun. Uh, Y'all should watch it. The best movie of the year. And uh, what's this? Oh, wow. That's so cool. Any questions? <laughs>